And uh, we'll move on to the next speaker of the day who's on Zoom, Nia Baselai. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. It's great to see you. Thank you so much for joining. Terrific. Martin, don't, don't go because um, I want to say something personally to you and nobody's hearing it now. That's great. Um, go ahead. So it's the last day. And actually people said, you know, Nir Barzil, I will tell you about three different things later. And no, I didn't know what I was going to talk about until yesterday. But okay. there's one thing I have to tell you. This has been the best geroscience meeting I've ever attended. Wow. Okay. Now Thank you, so you much. can say you can say my my memory is fading, uh, or that every meeting that I've been the last meeting that I've been was the best. But I just want to make this point. I, I, I think the last lecture just put it all together because the biology is exciting, the use of new technology, the use of AI was demonstrated here, and even the clinical parts of that were trying to emerge. You know, we are matured. Uh, there is a wave that we are uh, catching, no doubt about it, and I've, I've never been so optimistic. But I also want to thank you because this meeting is also about your leadership and how you're VCing. And if the audience can hear, we can start clapping now for Morton, no. not, not, for the, not, for the, not for the for the last time. And I also think that this hybrid model is here to stay because, quite frankly, I, 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 I couldn't come. You know that I wanted to come. I couldn't come because I'm seeing patients and I would have to quarantine on the way back. But I think you get more people and more attendance, and I I'm just excited about everything that happened. So thank you uh, so much for that. Thanks, now, Nia. I'm, now you can go. I'm, I'm <laughs> yes, okay. please share your screen, Nir. I, and thank you before, so much for the words. Before sharing my screen, I just want to say that I decided to stand here um, be, as my roles as biologist and geneticist and an MD and somebody who's running clinical uh, trial and has a biotech. And uh, it's people like Jim Kirkland and Tom Rando and Ev Eric Ravusi were too few of us. And I just wanted to change my talk and give the, my perspective of gerotherapeutics because I can see maybe a bigger field than others can. And I want to start by, uh, I'll do several provocation, but this is the first one. Uh, when we go to medical school, uh, the first day of medical school, they teach us primum non nocere. It's Latin for do no harm. Because in fact, uh, our, our way to success has been paved with so many things that we've done wrong. And we're still killing more patients in the hospital uh, than any time before. But that means that we are immediately conservative. We, the doctors, are immediately conservative on the first day. On the second day, they tell us there's no always and there's no never in medicine, which also makes us very uncertain. Okay, that's how we are raised. And since developing drug, you have to go through the FDA I would just tell you that people at the FDA spend only those two days in medical school. And, and, and that's why you, you wonder how come it took the FDA 10 months and 5 billion shots of uh, immunization in order to, to get the immunization out of the market. That's how conservative the FDA in face of people dying and in face of clear success. Okay. And we have to understand that. Because after all, we want to move from the anti-aging field <laughs> that, that is snake oil and charlatans in, in the eyes of the people and in the eyes of the FDA and go into gerotherapeutics. And we need the FDA to do that. And there's no shortcut. You know, the idea that you can uh, take a drug and just monitor people of how they're doing, okay, this is not going to work because placebo is going to work 40% anyhow. So there's no other way but to go with the FDA. And this is a challenge because while for any other disease, you have the biological discoveries, you have the biotech, 
you test the drug. And by the way, then for every disease, you want more drugs. So the pharmaceuticals are pulling, putting more money into the biotechs and into the basic research. But the FDA doesn't recognize the prevention of aging as, as a problem. And when that happens, two things happen. Sorry. One is that healthcare providers are not going to pay for their clients. They don't have to pay for their clients. But if they don't pay for the clients, the pharmaceuticals who need business plan are not going to help us develop better combination drugs, et cetera. Okay, so it's very important for us at the field to have the FDA acknowledge that aging itself can be targeted. Now, Andrew Scott, who wrote a great uh, paper about the economy, the, the longevity dividend, that, by the way, accelerate, <laughs> accelerated uh, over what Jay Olshansky uh, wrote before, has suggested uh, those types of longevity. Uh, the first uh, 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 longevity is uh, this, the Strilberg case. It's from the, uh, the travel of Gulliver. And what, what that, you know, so Stalbridge was said, you know, you can live forever, okay, but you're going to age. So he went and accumulated age-related diseases, and this is the thing we want to prevent. So I would say we heard several geriatricians before, and my disappointment was those, those geriatricians didn't hear about geroscience. When, when they hear us talking, they actually think that we just want to get more old people to their clinics. But that's not what we want. We, do, we want to do the prevention so old people are not getting into the clinic. The second case is the compression of, a, of morbidity. It's the Dorian Gray case. Dorian Gray stopped aging, but when he looked, but the mirror, when he saw himself in the mirror, the mirror continued to age. By the way, I'm pretending I'm that. I'm looking at the mirror and I'm saying the mirror is aging. Uh, so that's the Dorian K. I'll get, I'll get back to that. There's the reversing aging, the Wolverine case. Uh, reversing aging is the toughest thing. In other words, to take an old person and turn it young is hard. But in a way, the senolytics is doing that. It doesn't turn us young, but it turns us younger, not us, the animals for now. And, and then our ultimate goal is the Peter Pan, that we never age. And I, and I thought we heard several talks like that of doing intervention early on that lasts really for a long time. It's, it's the Dorian Gray case that we're dealing, uh, as far as moving forward, that's the case we're really uh, moving forward. And um, I just want to show something about my centenarians. It's not only... This is, uh, this is how much diseases they have, okay? They all live longer. And when they get their disease, and while regular older people at age 80, 90% of them have disease or just 10% or so don't have a disease, centenarians are healthy 20, 30 years longer. And at age 100, 30% of them don't have a disease. In fact, those people will just die one day in their sleep. So it's this health span and lifespan that we're trying to imitate. And more important, there's a longevity dividend there because um, to treat them in the last two years of life is third of the cost of, of, of those who are uh, much younger. So how do we do the Dorian, uh, uh, the, the Dorian Gray case? Uh, so uh, I'm showing again, like for the hundredth time, the hallmark of aging and I'm showing that really to remind you that there is an interaction. In other words, you don't have to uh, treat all of them, uh, all of them, in order to get an effect. The hallmarks are not causation. Okay, maybe some of them are, but but you know, uh, so you fix protostasis and it all becomes better. But why does protostasis decline? We, we don't know. We don't know. And maybe there is a hierarchy. But the point that I want to say is those hallmarks of aging have helped us uh, get the biotechs going because we kind of have a target. So every biotech has kind of an idea of what they are going to, to target. So that was why it was so important. But I want to make another uh, 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 case. 
And this is why targeting one affects others. And I want to bring here a paper uh, that we wrote not long ago where we uh, took all the information we knew about uh, metformin and asked which, which of those uh, hallmarks of aging they're targeting. And the answer is all of them. Okay, all of them. Really, metformin happens to target all, all the target of aging. And I think the concept here, and each one of us says it a little bit differently, but the concept here is if you have a drug that tr truly targets aging, if it takes old cell or old organ or old body and make it young, you're going to have improvement in many other things. And this is why we got into arguments about sirtuin and rapamycin. Everybody says, no, it does this, it does that. We don't know what it does, but the fact is that it rejuvenates the cells and that's why we get so, so much effects. You know, metformin, uh, from the FDA perspective, it's the oldest drug almost that's, that, that's, that's used today. It's more than 70 years used, and it was used uh, to prevent flu and malaria, and then it was discovered that it lowers glucose in diabetes. It's generic and cheap. And I want to make one thing clear. In clinical studies, when I say clinical studies, control studies, it was shown that metformin prevent type 2 diabetes. This is the DPP trial, that it prevents cardiovascular disease. This is the UKPDS trial, that it prevents Alzheimer, MCI, and there are 200 uh, papers of associations, okay, that, that it prevents uh, uh, more, uh, cancer and it prevents mortality. So all those studies have been done, okay? We're trying to do here something else with TAG. Uh, by the way, uh, metformin decreased hospitalization and death from COVID. Nine studies around the world by up to two-thirds. In other words, if people were metformin, two-thirds of the, of the cases could have been uh, prevented. So the, the reason we do TAME is we're, we're giving it this another title. We're going to prevent aging, okay? We're not going to prevent any one of those diseases, so we want to do one study that will show that we are moving the cluster of diseases. And, and what I mean by that is that we're agnostic to what disease the subjects have and to what disease they're going to get. It doesn't matter to us. If, you're, if your um, mother is a diabetic, diabetic and you're obese, you're going to get diabetes first. Whatever you're going to get, because aging is the mechanism that is going to bring it out, we're going to move it, okay? In fact, we are careful not to have a significant event. Imagine if in two years, cardiovascular uh, events were significantly decreased. The FDA will tell us, stop the study. We cannot go on with a placebo when we know that this drug prevents cardiovascular disease and they'll never let us go for the aging. We want to cluster all the diseases together and have it as a template for the rest of the industry. By the way, uh, Andrew Scott, I mentioned before uh, his paper, uh, demonstrated, took the TAIN trial and demonstrated what will be the cost per individual for going through the TAIN trial when he looked at specific disease and the sum of the separated disease. And then there is a total effect that is a little bit more complicated, but let's take the sum of all effects. will uh, will um, will uh, save $80,000 per individual, which means that just doing this study on the, uh, well, we're doing it in 3,000 people, but 1,500 on metformin, you can calculate that the study cost is going to be much less than, than the saving on the people who are going to be on, on this study. So now I'm going to show you the only data slide that I have. What do we do in the meantime? What we have to do in the meantime, and it is possible that several foundations are going to help us, is to do more TAME-like studies. If we can show a uh, around the world more than TAME, 
then it would be great. And so we sat down. And when I say we sat down, I'm talking about several people from Einstein who were biologists and clinicians. George Cushel, who's one of the prime geriatrician in the U.S., Felipe Sierra, you know, biology of aging. And we try to uh, have a geroscience approach. In other words, uh, we want to see uh, the geroscience of FDA-approved drug so that we can repurpose them immediately and ask questions like Tay. So l- let me take you through that. Uh, there, uh, those drugs that we identified and, and the reason a drug shows up here is because there is an animal, a, a mammalian study, I mean, mice or rat, that showed that this drug delays aging. If there is one study like that, we included it here. And it gets one point for, for that. Then we looked here. Uh, w- then we have a 12-point a, a scale. And actually, let me just uh, put it, uh, b- let's show the 12 point because you can start seeing yourself how we ranked those drugs that are here based on a geroscience uh, approach. And interestingly, metformin has only 11 points because uh, metformin didn't make a positive ITP test. There's lots of other studies that show that it increased lifespan, but it failed the ITP, so it lost a, a point. Now, how do we get to 12 points? Half of them are for preclinical data, you know, in animals, and half of them are for clinical data in humans. So the preclinical data includes if they have hallmarks of aging, if there's a preclinical data on health span, okay, not on lifespan, and if there is a preclinical data on lifespans. The preclinical points are for hallmarks if there are more than three hallmarks, less than three hallmarks, the health span in- increase is two points, ITP is two points, non-ITP is one point. This is uh, just uh, going over really fast. For the human, and I want to take more time about that, for the human, we were looking at human health span and human mortality. Now, this is the point. All those drugs are target one disease by the FDA uh, approval. We're not looking at this one disease. We're looking if this drug has happened to affect other diseases, okay, that's the health span, or mortality. And then we distinct between observation study or association study, where they get one arm, and versus clinical study, when actually it was studied against placebo and against a other drug, and then it gets more points. Now, it's important to note that some of these studies, some of these studies, were not, they get zero, zero in human mortality. And by the way, when I talk about human mortality is, is giving overall mortality that is different than specific mortality. I'll give an example in a minute. But uh, some of those have not been assessed and they get zero point, but it's not that it's, it's zero result, it's not assessed. So you're probably wondering what is this S- SGLT2 inhibitor? And uh, the SGLT2 inhib- inhibitor, it's interesting, when I was a fellow at Yale in the 80s, those are the two drugs that I looked at the mechanism of action for diabetes. SGLT2 was fluorazine. Basically what it does, it uh, blocks uh, uh, the glucose transport in the kidney. So if you're a diabetic and you have high glucose, glucose goes up out of the kidney and is not reabsorbed back, back to the body. So you're just losing the glucose. And as long as your glucose is hyperglycemic, you're going to, to lose it. So it's a great drug. And we've noticed in the last years that it has much more effects than on diabetes only. And two points here. First of all, last October, JCI inside inside the ITP group have shown that uh, SGLT2, one of the SGLT2, which is canoglifazine, have increased uh, lifespan mainly in male animals. 
Uh, so it passed an ITP test. The second thing is that when you look at the outcomes, uh, look, there are renal specific outcomes. So this is an anti-diabetic drug, but when you look at renal outcomes co compared to placebo, it really has a huge effect on renal outcomes. And as far as cardiovascular disease, also a huge effect on cardiovascular disease. So those are two diseases <laughs> that it's not supposed to, to treat. And, and also, when you look at that from any cause, in other words, not the cardiovascular specific and not the renal specific, you also got an effect. So we have a great clinical trial that shows that this has an effect. I'm finishing uh, uh, with final thoughts, uh, Morten. I can see you. So we, we, I, I want to make a few points. We cannot assume that studies in nematodes need to be translated, okay? When somebody says in, me, in nematodes I gave, uh, I, I saw that it doesn't work in aging. Well, there are clinical studies that show that metformin works in aging. So we have to be careful. Um, we need to increase the pipeline uh, for aging. As somebody said, we're looking too much under the lab, the lamp. Um, I, I, I think the chondritin sulfate uh, paper was really good in demonstrating that. I'm not going to take more time about it. Human genetics is key to, to drug development, okay? Uh, we are working with Regeneron to get 10,000 centenarians so we can find all the longevity genes. The longevity genes that we found so far are consistent with what we know from animals, mTOR, IGF signaling pathway, et cetera. Uh, uh, parallel testing, as I just suggested, should be part of what we're, we're doing. And, 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 and in parallel, also, we should go and see if the Peter Pan, I, I think it's going to be easier to prevent aging than actually to, to, to treat aging, and we should uh, go about it. I, I want also to just say biomarkers of aging has to be validated if they have been um, successful against treatment, and we're very weak on that. So let me just uh, uh, close here and be able to take uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nia. <laughs> really great talk. Um, so uh, we have a number of questions on Slack, and I highly encourage you to go to Slack uh, afterwards. Um, the most upvoted question is, surprisingly, no, I'm not, now I'm sort of glorifying myself. It's from me, I'm sorry. Um, what are your thoughts, and you've sort of touched on it in the end, what are your thoughts about biological clocks as trial endpoints? Uh, yes, I, I think that's the most important thing. It's not anymore about distincting between biological and chronological age, but finding the biomarkers that will change when, when we give drug. Uh, I published, and I, I, I wanted to show initially, a proteomic clock. Actually, somebody saw there are two papers, one in Nature Medicine, but one on elderly only. And what was surprising for me initially, part of the proteomic was breakdown of tissues, of collagen, of white blood cells, of other things. And I think breakdown of tissue is going to be the more important important hallmark for us because no matter how we treat aging, we have to stop the breakdown. So I think we'll get there, we'll develop clocks that could be epigenetics, could be proteomic, could be others. But the point is we have to show that with treatment, it stops. And as I said, I, I don't think that we have, da we have data here and there that we criticize a lot, but we really don't have what is going to change with treatment? All right. Do we have any? Uh, there are plenty of questions on Slack. Uh, maybe we'll take one more question from uh, from uh, Slack. And I think I've heard some rumors also. So earlier this year, you mentioned a new billion-dollar nonprofit for curing aging, which will initiate team-like trials, such as for rabamycin and acabose. Any updates on this? Have you thought about? I guess you have thought about trial designs, but let's start about any updates. Um, so the, the update that I have, this is a, a, this is a, a non for profit that's called Evolution. You're not going to find anything. They are still in the closet, okay? That uh, just now applied for a 501C, that means 
They want to be centered in the United States and recognized as a non-for-profit organization. This is a process that will take a few months. So I hope that by the end of the year, they'll make their uh, announcement. I'm, I'm very excited about that, that them coming in. I wish they did it before, but you know, from a TAME perspective, we cannot start TAME because of COVID anyhow. So right. whenever they'll come, it'll be great. All right, sounds fantastic. Uh, I really think we need to move on. I'm terribly sorry, but please go on Slack if you have any questions and give Nia another round of applause. Thank you. <laughs>